So thank you very much, Pramila. Um, uh, I'll have to shorten my little paragraph so we can get through the introductions quicker. Uh, I'll be talking today um, about emerging therapeutic approaches for ASD and shifting paradigms and improving outcomes with mitochondrial cell danger response and healing cycle systems research. So here are my disclosures. And the summary of my talk is, you know, what we currently call mitochondrial dysfunction is really more about dynamics than damage. And I want to keep emphasizing that it's really about, you know, um, the regulation of the progression of systems, their dynamics rather than specific damage. So program changes in mitochondrial structure and function actually are necessary to drive progress through the stages of healing and that blocks in the healing cycle or universal feature of neuro neurodevelopmental disorders and chronic illness. So uh, there are a few vocabulary, two vocabulary words that I just want to um, introduce. So one is salogenesis. Um, it's the regulated process of healing. Um, it comes from the root word salus, uh, the Roman goddess of personal health. And then purinergic is a cell signaling system initiated by ATP and, and related purines and pyrimidines. And it's you know just um, the name of this system um, just in the same way that serotonergic um, refers to serotonin signaling systems. So this is a slide that illustrates two different and complementary perspectives for understanding disease. And I call this the silos versus roots perspective. So classically, since World War II, we really focused on building deep silos of knowledge um, uh, you know, different diseases well, from primary mitochondrial disease, autism, MECFS, et cetera. And we've studied the metabolomic features of each of these different diseases in an effort to, um, to try to go past the visible differences and toward the hidden connections uh, and similarities of disease. And so one of the things that we find is that, there, that the failure to complete the healing cycle um, is a root characteristic of all, this dis all these disorders. Okay, so, so again, it's interesting that, that um, even in spite of many differences, it is, it is, you know, all these different disorders are connected by similarities. We'll focus on autism, but really as a, as a key that illuminates our, our more broader understanding of uh, healing in general. So why are mitochondria important? Well, it turns out that mitochondria actually are essential for the cellular response to any kind of injury, whether it's a, you know, a, a cut, a great knee, a broken leg, stroke, or a heart attack, mitochondrial networks fragment. And that's what we see down here. You have a you know, this filamentous form of mitochondria that go to a more fragmented form with injury. They actually release mitochondrial DNA um, through backs, backs, macropores. Um, and that with healing, you reestablish the, the mitochondrial network, but that can be blocked. And when it's blocked, people can't heal. And when people can't heal, they have um, chronic disorders. Okay, so what is the cell danger response? Um, this it, we model this with an archetypal stress, which is a, a you know let's say a viral infection. And one of the first things that happens is that it produces a coordinated multi-system ontogenetic. That means basically you know a gene associated response initiated by an electron steal. Um, or that produces a voltage drop across mitochondria. So when mitochondria decrease their oxygen consumption, um, the, the actual dissolved oxygen concentration in the cell um, rises and results in a number of different changes in a net shift of polymer to monomer synthesis and changes in behavior that, um, uh, that, that are um, ultimately designed to promote um, healing by diverting resources away from external activities and toward internal um, processes. So um, one of the things that we you know, know well in science is that scientists can't really focus, achieve the laser focus that they need for understanding a problem unless they have a name for that problem. Um, and so it turned out that you know, there, there wasn't a, you know, a name to actually um, be a, a natural counterpoint to the process of producing disease. And so going back to the root, we produce, we, we came up with a word, coined the word salogenesis as, as a, a way of describing the process of returning from health to disease. So the pathogenesis is what we um, know as going from health 
the conditions that that and steps that are necessary to to produce chronic illness. Um, that can be anything from genes to pollution to trauma or infections. And the engineering approaches to this kind of assessment, analysis, and treatment of acute intervent acute abnormalities has been very effective. We call that the first book of medicine. But once you have a chronic illness, it turns out that you don't just replay the tape of pathogenesis. You actually have to use a completely different pathway. Um, and that pathway is called salogenesis. We call that LIM2. It's associated with post-COVID long haulers, ME-CFS, PANS, PANDAS, and post-traumatic stress disorder, post-Lyme, many different chronic uh, disorders. And one of the things I'll be talking about today is how along that path back to health, um, there can be a number of uh, events that will actually cause cell stress and cause the cell to release extracellular ATP, which is a fundamental cell danger response mediator. So EATP. Okay, so I guess one of the things I wanted to point out is that engineering, while very, engineering logic, while very effective in treating acute disorders, is not very effective at, a tr at, at treating chronic disorders because we have to actually make use of this evolutionarily conserved sequence of events that has a beginning, middle, and end um, uh, in order to, uh, to, to achieve um, uh, the recovery of health. Um, and that's what we call the second book of medicine. So I gave this talk um, a few years ago at the National Institutes of Health, and, and um, one of the organizers came up to me afterwards and said, uh, great talk, Dr. Navi, but I hope you're wrong. And so why is that? And, and I asked, and they says, because if you're right, then the National Institutes of Health has been funding biomedical research um, aimed at just one limb of a two limb problem or one, one part of a two part problem. Okay. So pathogenesis this, asks the questions, what are the steps and causes of disease? Salogenesis asks the question, what are the steps and causes of healing? These are not the same thing. So we use metabolomics and studied autism, ME-CFS, goal for, you know, to aging and uh, worm models um, with mass spectrometry. And what we found um, using receiver operator characteristic curves is that there was a fingerprint of, um, uh, of the metabolic features of each of these disorders that could be used for diagnosis with 85 to 100 percent accuracy and some, um, and, and that there if you look over on the right-hand side, the sunflower is actually a, um, a more artistic version of a Venn diagram where each ellipse contains the set of biochemical abnormalities that, are, uh, that contain both unique and shared uh, features. Um, and whether you're talking about a mitochondrial disease like Lee syndrome or autism spectrum disorder, Lyme or Gulf IV, OCD, each of these actually has both unique metabolites um, uh, and shared metabolites. And the shared ones include things that are very familiar to this group, one carbon metabolism, glutathione, microbiome abnormalities. And these are all related to, um, can be reproduced by actual experimental increases in extracellular ATP. Okay, so one of the things that, you know, um, a way of visualizing this is think of life a, as kind of a cycle, a circadian cycle going from wakeful activity and nutrient intake with a little bit of stress resulting in some extracellular ATP release that then has to get metabolized back to adenosine and the adenosine is used to initiate sleep. And so we go in that cycle. But if there's a, a significant increase in that stress um, produced by toxins, infections, metals, and pollution, then there's more ATP increase. In, um, and then that leads to um, the sequence of events that goes from inflammation to proliferation to, um, to uh, differentiation and remodeling. And in fact, we can document changes in mitochondrial uh, structure and function um, over just minutes. Uh, over on the right, you can see we're going from this nice, healthy filamentous um, form that we call this spaghetti morphology to meatball morphology, which is indicative of, of inflammation and, and uh, this, what we call CDR1. So it turns out you cannot have inflammation without a change in mitochondrial function. Okay, so so I'll, so the mitochondrial um, have different structural names and functional names. We call these M1 and M0 and M2 mitochondria, 
And, and in order to achieve inflammation, we actually have to downregulate the oxidative function of mitochondria. Um, and, and, and the cell becomes more glycolytic. In order to achieve proliferation to actually restore cells that are lost in the original infection, um, we have to actually engage aerobic glycolysis from M, with M0, cells containing M0 mitochondria. And then um, in order for um, that tissue to fully heal, the cells that were recently born have to exit the cell cycle and have to take their cues from neighboring cells, what genes to turn off, what genes to turn on in order to remodel and, and recreate the functional mosaic that's um, characteristic of every different tissue. And so that requires a restoration of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. And then when we get back to the, the, the health cycle, um, the normal circadian var variations are restored. Okay, so you know one of the hypotheses that we're putting forward is that chronic disease results because of blocks in this cycle. So the the three forms and uh, and functions of, of mitochondria are objective uh, and easily identified. Um, so with a with an injury, mitochondria become fragmented, um, and this this cycle is initiated. Um, and it'll start with M1 mitochondria that are adapted for reactive oxygen production and glycolysis, and they lose their endoplasmic reticulum connections. And then they're M, then as we move to, to um, CDR2, they're M0 mitochondria that actually take on a more electron dense matrix um, and engage in um, interactions with uh, what are called mitochondrial associated membranes or MAMs. And then, uh, then oxfos is, is fully restored, and, and then uh, in, in this CDR3 um, stage that requires M2 mitochondria. And so, we, so the M1 mitochondria support a pro-inflammatory phenotype, M0 the proliferative phenotype, M2 a pro-resolving and anti-inflammatory pathway. And... Um, and, and these have characteristic and classical uh, metabolic features of glycolysis, aerobic glycolysis, and oxfos, um, respectively. Likewise, the cells um, can be differentiated according to various biochemical features, including, you know, so for lactate is elevated in CDR1 and low in CDR3. Um, there's, I'm going to emphasize nitric oxide here which is high initially and intermediate and then low in, in CDR3 because we're gonna come back to this um, at the end of the talk. So wound healing is started and ended by extra, extracellular ATP signaling. So when a cell is injured it, uh, or, or stressed, the ATP is released and that acts like, a, like the, the wood on a campfire um, that, that fuels the, the fire until the, the, the fuel is burned, burned down. And so in this graph, we show how extracellular ATP is re released um, uh, with injury. And then over a period of time, a few several days, um, that is, uh, it, it is consumed or metabolized. And that is, corresponds to the stages of healing, uh, classical um, histopathic pathological stages. They're called hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. Um, I'll emphasize this window of subacute um, uh, change between one and five days because we'll come back to that at the end. So, so during the healing cycle, and CDR one is uh, so supports inflammation, two uh, supports proliferation, and three supports remodeling. Um, and the extracellular ATP levels are high, medium, and low. So, what happens when extracellular ATP it does, is not consumed, okay, or not fully metabolized. Well, it creates blocks. So the progression of healing um, is blocked because the normal um, uh, thermodynamic gradients um, between cells are 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 not um, reestablished. And likewise, if you are re-injured before healing is, is occurs, that you can restart the the cycle again. So this is you know in a, in um, an interesting um, ancient signaling pathway uh, that 
um, was actually the first hints of this were um, were given by Carl von Frisch's work um, on Shrek stuff, the, the the alarm substance that was released by minnows um, in response to predator um, stress. And so in them, um, that recently is found to be hypoxanthine um, and oxide. But in mammals, uh, it's it's also um, uh, what we find is xanthine itself made from um, uh, for, from purines um, will trigger an anxiety response and activates T cell immunity, intensifies aversive memory, um, uh, and, and regulates the inter interferon regulatory factor one, leukotrienes, and uh, reactive oxygen species, in addition to mitochondrial fusion um, proteins. So, so purines actually are involved um, in over half of the mitochondrial enzyme proteome. So here's a, a, the mitochondrial proteome. It varies from cell type to cell type, but there are about 1,200 different um, proteins that constitute the proteome. And, and about uh, nearly 800 of those are, are catalytically active enzymes, so 70%. And over half of those enzymes are regulated by purines. Many of them will um, uh, trigger the, the release of intracellular calcium. But um, the, in general, the, this purine signaling is, you know, has been tied to metabolic syndromes, dysautonomia, dysmotility syndromes, mast cell activation, MMP3, um, MMP13, um, histamine, other metallomatrix um, uh, proteases. And, and then ultimately, you know, these symptoms or, or systems are also involved in, in something called the septab, the symptom septab of, uh, of chronic fatigue syndrome. It also is interestingly very common in, in patients, post-COVID long hauler patients. So why is extracellular ATP signaling is important? Well, it's a key feature of a, a cell danger signal. There's, a, you know, there are 19 different receptors um, in our genome that respond to this. They're widely distributed. So it's a key regulator. Here's a little cartoon that actually shows that that all stress cells will will re will release ATP in a regulated fashion, um, in proportion to the stress. So mitochondria are talking to the nucleus. They're also talking to neg to right to, to neighboring cells through. Um, these channels that in this case I've right I've um, uh, illustrated the Panexin P2X7 channels that will open up and uh, under reactive oxygen stress and biomechanical stress of the cell, but then close down when the cell is in baseline function. So we so what happens when the extra when pools of ATP are lost um, uh, through these channels? It produces a dissipative loss. And so we went looking for drugs that might actually block that loss. Um, it turns out that um, other drugs are being developed to specifically block the PANX in one channel. So PNX3 is uh, being developed by PANX Therapeutics, a, a company that is looking at this whole biology as it relates to, to chronic pain syndromes, but also other disorders. So if you want to really study this experimentally, one way to do it is to actually inject a mouse with, with ATP and then study their breath and their behavior and, and metabolism um, uh, over the course of time. And when we did that, what we found is that ATP profoundly um, reduced overall uh, mitochondrial function and heat production that resulted in a temperature drop in their basal body temperature from a normal of 38 degrees down to, you know, almost 30 degrees um, in, you know, just within 30 to 60 minutes, okay? Um, and so, so we, that's an acute drop. I'm, I'm gonna um, at, emphasize this importance of the temporal um, uh, windows for, for these different responses. Okay, so extracellular ATP produced also a 74% decrease in basal metabolic rate when we looked at how the whole animal oxygen consumption in clams cages. So um, when we looked at the rate of oxygen consumption, it decreased by 74% here um, in, in animals that were treated with ATP compared to saline treated animals. And then the other interesting thing is when you do a metabolomic analysis after ATP injection, this you know 30 minutes after the ATP injection, um, 
you get a, you know over half of the metabolome being changed. There's well over 200 different chemicals that are changed, including dopamine, adenosine, and hypoxanthine that are, that are um, increased, and then a number of amino acids, including uh, methionine, um, uh, are, are decreased acutely. And this, so, so ATP actually was interesting and in it produced more changes in the metabolome than any drug that we've ever studied. Okay. Um, now, what's interesting is when you take an animal um, that is a, 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 an animal model of autism-like behaviors, um, this in our case, we looked at the maternal immune activation um, uh, model that is produced by exposing the animals, um, uh, the, a pregnant female to um, double-strand RNA as a, a simulated virus infection um, for for one day um, in, um, in mid-pregnancy. And uh, what that does is it produces uh, pups that are born with activated micro brain microglia for life, okay? And altered behavior for life. So they start out interestingly um, uh, with this gold, gold lines at, you know, with a lower body temperature, okay? And then when you re-expose them um, as adults to, uh, to poly IC or ATP, what you see is this triphasic response, an increase, a hypometabolic response. And then, and then animals that are controls, okay, that, that um, are no, animals that uh, have normal social behavior and interaction um, uh, that are exposed to, to poly IC postnatally, um, what you see is that after about three to five days, um, you know, they, they will, uh, they will rec recover their uh, body temperature. But what happens in the, the MIA model is that they have a rebound increase in their body temperature that lasts for two to four weeks in the, in the gold there. Okay. So again, that's happening not in the first hour, but in the first one to five days. Okay, so then we looked at children um, uh, uh, in response to routine vaccination. This was a study in collaboration with Judy Vandewater at UC Davis, um, where we did metabolomics before routine vaccination and then two days after. And then what we found is the most altered pathway after um, vaccination turned out to be um, plasma purines. And these were increased 10 to 800 fold uh, by two days after the vaccination. So here's adenosine increasing, um, inosine, guanosine. And these it, were the same, they, in, whether the child had ASD or TD, they both responded the, the same, okay, um, in the concentration of adenosine in their plasma, okay. Um, however, we know from those metabolic, the temperature um, uh, measurements uh, um, that, that the, even though the concentration of purines was the same, their physiologic response to purine signaling was, was, was different. And so here's an illustration of this now in children, okay? So, you know, just, um, and so again, the children before vaccination were actually different um, significantly in their basal body temperature. So children with autism had actually a little bit lower body temperature than normal on average. And then there was a triphasic response after immunization. Um, and the typically developing kids uh, returned back to baseline um, within uh, three to five days. But the, the children with autism had this rebound increase in body temperature um, that was above their baseline for uh, between, between 10 days to 30 days. And we call that the delayed metabolic hypersensitivity response. So when we looked at their metabolomic network in autism and then help, and typically developing controls, what we found um, in an unbiased, you know, a, a, analysis and asking the question, what was the pathway that had the most connections to the rest of all of metabolism? What we found is it was the, was purines. And these were connected to over 30 different pathways in um, uh, children with autism, but only about a dozen pathways in, in typically developing children. So we did a, a study of antipurinergic therapy using uh, Suramin, which is the only drug that was um, uh, available for, um, that, that could competitively inhibit ATP signaling. 
Um, and we did a study, um, we called it the, the SAT-1 or Serum and Autism Treatment Trial 1 in, in 2015 and 16. Um, it's just 10 kids. Serum has to be given IV. It's not, or, um, not absorbed well orally. Um, and when we did that in a double-blind, placebo-controlled way, and then broke the, um, the blind, the children that had received Serumin all had improvements, and the children that received placebo did not. And when we looked at ADOS scores on uh, you know, their, uh, their core um, symptoms of, of autism spectrum disorder, what we found is that in the sermon treated group, they went um, from an average you know, of, of eight and a half to down to seven, which is the threshold for the division between on spectrum and off spectrum. Um, and placebo did not change significantly. And the question is going to be, that was after one dose, so the question would be after three doses or more, um, do some children, uh, are, able, are they able to come off spectrum? And so, so just recently, an independent randomized uh, controlled clinical trial has been used to validate this, uh, this pure energetic signaling hypothesis. Um, the company Pax Medica um, conducted this trial um, of 52 children across six sites in South Africa. They did three months, three infusions, uh, two different drug doses. Um, and uh, the mean age was about eight and a half years. Um, and the, the results were reported just recently at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent.